Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. In today's episode, I'm joined by the lovely Jade Beeson and I've been on Jade's podcast. Jade, you were a guest speaker at our peak performance events and also you're absolutely killing it on socials. I've followed you well before the event, which is how I know you. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to talk everything YouTube, but also the broader picture of building a brand yeah. and really what that is. And, and there's so much depth to it which I, I think some people glaze over sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just seen as a, a vanity thing and mm -hmm. it's, it's really not. So firstly, welcome. And I'm going to throw the whole, give us a 30 second overview for anyone who might not have seen your face just yet. Sure, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Big fan of yours. And I, yeah, I feel like we've known each other for a little while now. It must be at least like a year, no? Yeah. I when was so. the event? No, just, just over. Uh, it was last... I can't even remember. I think Let's we literally did it like last this this time, <laughs> this time last, last year. year. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Like maybe mid Feb. Yeah, love it. Well, I'm Jade. <laughs> I'm a content creator. I create content which helps my fellow creators learn how to grow an audience and turn that audience into an income. So I actually have a background in marketing. I worked in marketing for like eight years. And when I first started my YouTube channel, which is my primary channel, I very quickly turned it into a business. So I went from my first YouTube video to quitting my job, becoming a full-time creator within like six to seven months. It was very quick. Wow. And the main reason I was able to do that was because of my marketing and business background. And I very quickly learned that there are so many creators who could do so much more than what I have achieved, but aren't earning an income from their content simply because they don't have the same experience that I had. Yeah. So therefore I just dedicated all my content to trying helping them like fill that knowledge gap. So that's what we're gonna dive into. And just for everyone watching at home, we're really gonna tap into, it's so important to have those skill sets. Like mm. you said, you knew about the marketing. And mm. I think what we wanna do is debunk the fact that this isn't just a case of pick up the camera yeah. and you can become a full-time content creator. Yeah. Like you are a business person mm. first and foremost. So let's just start at the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. We are on the cusp of going into February, 2024. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing people need to identify if they're thinking to themselves, right, I'm hearing a lot about building a brand. What yeah. does that really mean? What does it entail? Is it something I can do full time? Like, where are the stepping stones mm. in the very beginning stages of kind of figuring out what is a brand and how do you go about building one? Yeah, for sure. Well, there's a couple of things to consider because everyone uses social media now, which is amazing. I think a lot of people don't realize that there is a difference between using social media casually mm. and using it to build a brand and a business. So the first step in my opinion is making the decision to do that because your approach to content creation, to everything that you do on social media is going to change when you decide actually, look, I'm trying to build a business here and a brand. It's no longer just about like what you wanna share and now it's about what your audience wants to see. And that is a very big, switch like that's a huge mindset shift to have it's one that a lot of people struggle with because they're like i just thought i could carry on just like sharing my favorite pics from the weekend <laughs> and unfortunately some people can do that and it works but for most of us we actually need to start putting like our business critical thinking hat on and we need to figure out who the audience is that we're trying to attract and then we have to start creating content for them yeah i think that's the key thing is when you start out you actually i believe you have to be more analytical and, mm. and very technical about how you're actually yeah. approaching content because a lot of people will start well i love this mm. i'm going to talk about my dogs yeah <laughs> well again not everyone wants to know about your dogs yeah. right so i do think in the beginning stages depending on the platform that you're on some platforms though are quite forgiving to allow mm. maybe a video to slip through and mm. i think maybe that can confuse some people mm. because i've had a few people that have said to me in the past well i had one video blow up and it was you know, there was this one guy I know um, who spun like this, these weights, right? And yeah. he spun it on the end of a barbell. Right. And I was like, dude, it popped. But going forward, you, there's no value in that. No, like you had a you video, doing that. Yeah, like you had a video <laughs> slip through. So again, like we spoke on your podcast, avoid mm. the dopamine hit mm. and really stay grounded on like, right, how am I going to serve people? Yeah. Do you see your followers as you're growing? I find it it's an obligation, like you're mm. trying to build a business. Mm. I see followers as potential customers. Like mm. my approach to how I see them, is that how you see your followers? And I feel say? like similar. So I have like this whole concept around building advocates. It's something that I've spoken about consistently since I first had my channel. It's kind of like the theory, you know, the 1000 True Fans book, like mm -hmm. the old school book, what talks about all you really need is a thousand true fans. I have been quite committed to attracting 
advocates to my community as much as I possibly can. So whether that means that they end up becoming clients or customers of like my membership or anything, that's one thing, but they could also be an advocate who doesn't necessarily buy for me, but supports my content to such an extent that they help me grow my audience, that maybe when I work with brands on sponsored content, they trust my recommendation and they purchase from the brand. So it's not always like a, a customer relationship. It's more like a advocate kind of thing for yeah. me. That's what I really try to build. I, we were talking on the way up here. We were just having the conversation around, there's this whole movement I really feel, and I think I even touched on this on your podcast, is mm -hmm. around showcasing uh, who you are, like being quite real and being authentic. Yeah. Because I feel, I, and I watched the podcast as well, YouTube specifically is very promotional of aesthetics, good setup, like mm -hmm. this, like works mm -hmm. well. And I feel like we're on this cusp of actually kind of like we don't need all the shiny lights. Mm. Like it's going back to more raw and real. Yeah. Because I feel we've been fed so much crap yeah. over what is this perfect lifestyle? What should we be putting out as content creators? I feel like now you can yeah. kind of keep it more simple and just show yourself. And I think that's yeah. a good thing, right? Yeah, there's definitely a culture shift that I feel like it's been happening for the past year. And I think TikTok are a huge reason for that. I think they were the driving force behind that. And it's yeah. changed the way that we are seeing content, but also primarily the way that the younger generation are responding to content. And there's always a time in life where the younger generation, which was previously us, um, we were kind of defining and like setting the culture. And we were the ones that people would look to and write these articles about when they're reviewing whether a brand is cool or whether a social media platform is cool. That's now shifted. So now that's Gen Z. And they're the ones who are kind of defining what kind of content they want to consuming. And that's kind of leading the way. And I feel like younger generations are far more interested in like authentic, raw content mostly because that's what performs really well on TikTok, where you can just whip your camera out, have no lighting, just be like in your room, in bed, talking to the camera and it can get 10 million views. That would never have happened mm -hmm. like in our day of social media when yeah. we were young and great. Not at all. We were all about like Instagram, 15 filters on a photo, a border. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we were yeah. the complete opposite. So I think there's definitely a huge shift. And I think it started with TikTok and now it's slowly kind of cascading to the other platforms. So with YouTube, I think YouTube will always value like a nice production setup for mm -hmm. some channels or some niches, but it's no longer a requirement. Yeah. It's not like you can't grow if you don't have that, yeah. which is great news because a lot of us don't start our journeys with like this. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> and, and you eventually get to this if you want it. Mm. But again, like you, what we were saying, you have to work out return on time invested mm. is it worth it or could i grow organically just by picking up my yeah. phone and having a cheap plug-in mic there yeah. is a guy at the moment who everyone's talking about on youtube this sam sulik i don't think i know him. he's like this big old american body uh, mm. bodybuilder and he literally plonks his camera in his car mm. and in over a month he's now at 2.9 million followers Oh, wow. He's raked it in. He's absolutely jacked. What's he doing in the car? <laughs> he's, he's just vlogging every day. Oh, nice. On his way to the gym, he's talking about life, his workout, nice. his food. He is. It's just so organic. And that's yeah. what I mean. I feel like creating content now, you don't have to overthink it. Yeah. Like we were saying, you know, one of the worst things that we were talking about is the setup. Yeah. <laughs> like it's the worst. Oh my God, yeah. It you really procrastinate. is. procrastinate. Yeah, because setting up your studio, and it's so funny because I feel like a lot of the time when people watch other creators, they may not realize that they've just spent like half an hour to an hour setting everything up yeah. <laughs> to get to that shot. Because we try and make it look effortless, but yeah, it is so much work. And I do think it's amazing that that's not necessarily required. Like I started my channel with my old phone. Um, I didn't have a mic and I didn't, I never used to look in the lens. I used to look at myself in the screen because it I made me feel that. so much more comfortable, which, and I know so I used to get some comments being like, look at the lens and don't get me wrong. I got that as well. Is, did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think everyone does. Yeah, everyone does. The thing is, don't get me wrong, obviously you want to learn to look at the lens and I very much know how to do that now. But yeah. I always tell creators, like if you feel uncomfortable and this is the thing that will get you started, just looking at yourself using your phone with no microphone, then do that. Yeah. Because if someone had said to me in the early days, Jade, you can't start your YouTube channel if you're not gonna look directly in the lens, I probably would have been like, okay, cool, I'm not starting it. Like it yeah. would have really intimidated me. But instead I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna ease my way into it and improve slowly. And I did that for like the first six months. I'm sure I, I got monetized. I had thousands of subscribers before I even 
started to look at the lens and before I bought a camera, yeah. you know, and I'd quit my job by that point and I still hadn't looked at, yeah. <laughs> looked at the lens yet. <laughs> I, I did exactly the same, but you know what's nice about it is if you still have your original videos, right? Because mm, some people I have do. said, oh, why don't you get rid of like old videos and, you know, but I think one, I'm too uh, concerned about it affecting the algorithm. Mm. Like, I don't even want to test it, right? Mm. But when I look back, I had no lighting, I had no audio, I was mm. on my phone, on the reverse camera, so looking yeah, at yourself, yeah, yeah. and I was like, what a, what a way that I've come, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's, things have changed so much, but things can be really simple now. Mm. So look, building a brand for everyone listening, it's so much more than a brand. Like there's mm. a lot of talk now that brands will become billionaires, like mm. because it's so strong. And when a brand has developed credibility mm. and loyal following, mm. if it brings out a business, it can sell whatever the business is selling, right? So mm. for you, obviously this is important that we monetize, right? So anyone mm. watching this, uh, it's not a case that we haven't got anything else to do. Like, you know, we're business owners, we wanna mm. earn money from this, right? Mm. But how have you gone about kind of looking at this whole journey of building a brand mm. and making sure that you can make a living from it? Like, what was your initial thought process in thinking, I'm gonna get on camera, but like, when's the money coming in? Like, yeah. what, what did you go through? Yeah, so I made that switch and was like, right, how do we how do we monetize pretty early? To the point where it was quite laughable. Like I released my first ebook, I had like 200 subscribers and I always look back at that and I just think, who did I think I was? Like, love it, like completely delusional. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it. You wanna hold on to that Delulu as much as you can because that yeah. will drive you through. That yeah. naivety is honestly the thing that will drive you through when you're in your early days. So at the beginning, within like, pfft, six weeks of my first video, I was like, no, nope, I'm gonna make this a thing. This is what I wanna do. I think I found my thing. So one of the first thing I did was I started to build an email list. Again, had hundreds of people in my audience, yeah. had hardly anyone, but I was like, nope, it's never too early. I'm gonna start to build my email list. So I started to do that. Um, and then within, within about two months was when I created my first ebook. And the reason why I created that was because I was listening to my audience and I was just creating based on their demand. And that was my strategy for years. I'm only now kind of taking a step back and thinking, okay, well, let's marry audience demand with like what I want the future of my business to look like. In the beginning, I was very much creating content based on what my audience were responding to. And then I was developing products and services based on the questions that they were asking me. Yeah. And that is such a beautiful thing that social media allows you to do. When you're able to build an audience that way, they will literally tell you what they need from you. Like yeah. there is hardly any other business that can be created using that method of kind of audience feedback. Yeah. And back in my day of working in marketing with agencies and like really big brands and stuff, and they would hire agencies to do this audience research and it would take six months and it would mm. cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And it was robust, like it was very insightful. But I just think back to that and think, well, I know my audience better than I think any brand I ever worked with yeah. ever did. And that is simply because I've gone this route and I've built an audience on social media where they can tell me yeah. what they like and what they need help with. It's invaluable. So that was very much my approach. And yeah, I did that for a while and it worked really well. Oh, I love it. This podcast was sponsored by the Employment Breakout Programme, How to Fire Your Boss and Replace Your Income. If you want a life of purpose, one with time freedom and financial stability, head to the description below where you can join a free introduction webinar to learn how business could change your life. <laughs> and I love it because that is literally what I'm doing. Mm. You, you know, the great thing is, is we're not spending huge amounts on ads. Yeah. You know, we're not having to force an advert in front of someone's face, telling them, don't go anywhere, please yeah. listen to me. You know, this is like organic asking questions mm. through smart content, mm. which we also enjoy getting the answers of all the pain points of our customers yeah. to then go, right, I've got a thousand people that are all saying they have the same problem. Mm. I'm going to build something to the audience that seem like they're ready to buy. Mm. That's the thing, like the lead generation is nuts. Mm -hmm. So I think top tip here, just uh, if you're not already thinking it, when you're building an audience, you have to get the yes. data, yes. like collect data, whether it's the submissions form. I mean, how do you, how do you predominantly, obviously there's some smart, uh, tactics, mm. we all do it. Mm. But how would you say it's probably been one of your best conversions for data? Yeah, so for me, I'm all about creating like freebies or lead magnets. Um, works really well with my niche and with my audience. So a lot of the time I will have like one core freebie, let's call it. At the minute, mine is the creator income guide. So it's this big guide and it breaks down every single way you can earn money and it tells you how easy or hard it is and also your earning potential, right? I created that because it is the most relevant resource that I could produce for 
for my entire audience. So that is like my core freebie. So people download that and then I get their data as a, like in return for that. On the flip side, every now and then I'll do like short tactical bursts where I have a freebie that is specifically related to a video that I'm gonna upload that I know is probably gonna do really well. So I'll do a freebie just for that video or I'll do a freebie based on an offer that I know I'm gonna launch soon so that I can warm my audience up and get them thinking about it, you know? Yeah. So I do those maybe like once a quarter, but I yeah. always have my core freebie, which I update like once or twice a year. Yeah, that's really important, the warm up process. Mm. So I know too many people that have said to me, Aaron, I've launched this, mate, I've had no, I've had, and I'm like, show me where you've put it. You're mm. like, no, no, I've just launched it today. I'm like, dude, yeah. you haven't, you haven't warmed people up. Yeah. Like I always say, like we're showing you downstairs on the laptop, mm. I'm already signing up the pre-orders mm. for the next program because yeah. I've figured out what people want. I've got proof of concept. I'm just gonna start indicating back to the market that, hey, look, this is coming. Mm. Who wants to get involved? Mm. There's a demand, mm. that whole scarcity. So th this is the awesome thing about a brand, right? Something else which, uh, we spoke about briefly downstairs, let's just mm. dive into it, is mm. that there's this whole thing around, do we need content creation? Has it gone too far? Are there too many platforms? Is it causing mental health issues and stuff like mm. this? And I th really think it's how we use the platform. Yeah. I do feel that more people would need to be on these platforms because of lack of trust if you're not. Yeah. So what's your thoughts around, we? We actually doubt people if they're not active on socials. Yeah. yeah, I think, again, this comes back to what we were saying in the beginning about like the difference between how you use social media as a brand and a business versus for personal use. Mm -hmm. If you are a brand or a business and you don't have a social presence in 2024 and beyond, that is going to be a red flag for a lot of customers because the way that we research brands now, the way that we kind of, you know, communicate and, and actually interact with brands now is primarily through social media channels so if we don't have a way to look into your brand using social media and therefore see like social proof see testimonials from your clients see comments from your previous customers there's a big chance that your audience might not buy from you as a result so literally this happened yesterday there is a bag that i constantly see on tiktok shop and i really want it it keeps on popping up and then i was like okay do you know what i'm gonna buy it so i clicked on it and i was like oh I don't know you, like I don't know the brand, I'm, I don't mm. recognize it. So I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure. And then I went on their TikTok and went through like 20 posts to look at all the comments before I was like, okay, all right, I trust you. Because I had to see several comments from people being like, love this bag, can you release it in red? I needed that, otherwise I was not going to buy from them because I need some kind of proof that you are a legitimate brand. I need to see your customers and how they feel about you too. Like it's fundamental now. Super important mm. to see case studies mm. and actually people leaving comments saying, yeah, great, this, because then you can make your decision. And mm. I just want to, I know some people are gonna be thinking, well, and I had this in one of my comments is that, well, carpenters and chippy, you mm. know, same thing, but plumbers, builders, carpenters, they don't need to be on socials. I totally disagree because mm. I think one of the guys on TikTok who was, who was absolutely done a, a great sort of, um, almost, almost laid the blueprint in terms of how you can accelerate. Mm. And that is the pool guy. The mm. pool guy oh, is yeah. in a industrial <laughs> type business mm. where you have to physically clean pools. And what he's done is he's turned it into something unique. Yeah. Now, granted, I bet he charges an absolute packet. Um, if I had a pool, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna him. lie. <laughs> I wouldn't mind him cleaning the yeah. pool because yeah. I know service is gonna be great. Probably mm. get some quirky content. Mm. I'm thinking I'll get in that content as well yeah. for, for audience leverage. Yeah. But out of two people, I know he's gonna do the job yeah. because there's so much social proof. So yeah. it goes, I think there's like the bald builders, you've got like the cheeky carpenter or something like that. Mm. These people are selling themselves and they're building like five, six, seven figure businesses yeah. because they have so much reach. Yeah. So I I think, I don't know, why do people doubt it? Cause look, yeah. you can go in my comments and people go absolutely load of rubbish. The world would be a nightmare. And who's gonna, one of the comments was, who's gonna consume your content if everyone's a creator? What's your thoughts on that? Well, so first of all, I think people often forget that creators also consume content. So I am a creator yeah. and I just told you a story about how I picked whether or not to buy a bag. So it wasn't like, no, no, I am a creator. So I cannot look at your your content like that we can't i can't look at it and i can't <laughs> yeah. buy from you because i am a creator that's not how it works so yeah. i i get people's thinking sometimes especially when people are resistant to social media i get where the thinking com can come from but for the most part i often disagree there was another guy that i was just thinking of um when you were talking the patio washer guy 
There's someone who like uh, jet washes a yeah. patio. And I'm like, first of all, when I get a patio, I'm calling you. If you ever want to create your own jet washer, I'm buying it. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So yeah. I completely agree. I think a lot of the time, this way of thinking comes from when as humans, I think we naturally look for an example of when what you've said has not been the case and we cling to it. Yeah. So in that scenario, people are commenting that because they're like, but I know someone who isn't on social media, but makes a good living. That doesn't mean that that's the best way to go about their business. That's not what it means. There's anomalies to every single thing in the world. Yeah. And a lot of the time we immediately go, it happens in everything in life, doesn't it? Like yeah. it in happens. Walks. Yeah, in all walks of life. I mean, I was watching um, a content creator who, has, she's a mum. she's got a baby and all her comments are like well you know we didn't do that when we had our baby and she turned out fine and it just drives me up the wall because I'm like just because one thing happened one way it doesn't mean that that's the right way to do yeah. things do you know what I mean yeah. and I think that can sum up most like most of the reason why people comment that stuff yeah because they're just clinging to that one example they have where think where someone did it differently yeah uh, Tony Robbins did this awesome thing where he was interviewing someone and he said let me ask you a question and, and we can try uh, by the way I, I could totally cock this up if i say to you now look for everything in the room that is brown yeah now tell me one thing that was white the walls oh, the walls <laughs> anyway something like that i was looking at the know, pillows i should have gone with gray i cocked that up but what he did is he was like there was loads of brown in this room and he was like tell me loads of stuff that's brown and the guy was like it's brown. Yeah. But the, the moral of that was is that basically I've influenced what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. So if you have that on a mass scale and you're just surrounded by people who say, oh, it's really unhealthy. Mm. You know, co content, being on that camera, it's mm. so unhealthy. You know, mm. all you do is look at your phone. Yeah. Well, if we go back to the 80s and 90s, weren't you just consuming ITV, CNN and Sky yeah. News and The Sun? Yeah. Wasn't that really unhealthy? Yeah. Haven't we found out that most of that was like propaganda and yeah. it's very agenda driven? So... I do, again, when even building a brand, and if you're getting to that stage where you're like, cool, I've got to start generating a business and revenue, mm. I think that the safest thing to do, not only for your mental well-being, but is also be around other uplifting content yeah. creators yeah. that see opportunity yeah. rather than, that's, then like, that's really yeah. bad. And that could be so difficult, can't it, to, like, to start out and then surround yourself with people who really get it. And I think what's also really powerful about when you're surrounding yourself with other creators or business owners, that they can actually help you figure out what a good balance is. Because no one's saying that you have to be on your phone all the time. I remember I went out for dinner with my friends recently, and it was like a group of friends who I've not seen in a while. And like, I've literally not seen them in over a year. And they were like to me, it's so funny, I thought you'd be on your phone more. They were like, cause you, this is like what you do all the time now. And I've not seen them in a while. So they were like, I just thought you would be like constantly on your phone. And they were like, you've not gone on your phone once. And I was like, that's such an interesting thought that I reckon a lot of people who aren't in the industry or who want to join it think that the second they create content, it means that they are literally like this <laughs> yeah. all the time. I'm like, no, it's so intentional. Like when I'm on my phone and when I'm creating content, it's because I've sat down to create content and go on my yeah. phone. It's no different to when I was in my last job and I had to sit down to do a PowerPoint deck. Like that's what I was sitting down to do. It's no different. So it's like I think that was focus, really interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. That, that's the thing. If you see a footballer outside of the stadium and you see him in a park, do you mm. expect him to be in shorts and football boots yeah, all the yeah, time? Yeah, like, yeah that's so true. <laughs> you know, no, he's walking his dog. Yeah. But <laughs> it's totally true. I have that a lot as well in terms of when people are saying to me, look at this guy telling people to go start his own business, which which I only I only talk about the content in terms mm. of, you know, you've got the two options, right? So, But you'll always get people who go, oh, he's telling everyone. Um, it's not that, but what it is, is that uh, there's this whole misconception, especially around business and mm. content creation, like you say, you've always mm. got your ha phone in your hand. It's not like that. We're very, I think when you start to work for yourself, you're building a brand or a business and you're, you're using socials, uh, you actually almost don't want to be on it anyway. So yeah. you're using it for the purpose. Mm. And don't get me wrong, we're blessed that we can actually do it. Like mm. we get to do it. I think yeah. I think you did a yeah, video as well about it that. It was a story that I uploaded the other day because I, I was procrastinating filming and then I had to reframe it in my mind and be like, no, I get to film. This is a privilege that I get to do yeah. this. <laughs> but it's true though, can... isn't it? Yeah. Like, and, and I did a video on that is actually that sometimes, you know, we actually realize that this is what I wanted to mm. do and, you know, the setup and sometimes really annoying. Yeah. But other than that, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah but we are really in the zone for those few hours yeah. and it doesn't consume up like no. other time. We don't procrastinate too much, no. right? Yeah. So just in terms of avoiding procrastination, 
your daily routine mm. like what does that look like to be really productive in creating content yeah so this is actually quite a new routine because I'm, I'm a very much like a new year new me kind of girl yeah <laughs> I always have new goals <laughs> I always have new routines but it's always some variation of this so I always wake up at 6 a.m every single morning but I go to bed at 10 I like my sleep like I and if I'm going to go to bed really late then I will push back the time I wake up because I just prioritize my sleep over almost anything else and then I will go to the gym for like an hour come home I normally want to be working by like half seven some mornings I might not go to the gym and I'll just start working straight away at six and those, those are often my most productive days yeah. I am a morning person much to my husband's dismay I mornings are the best time of the day for me yeah. and I always think with other people when they're like but I don't want to wake up at six I don't think everyone has to wake up at the same time I think you have to know when you thrive yes and I used to have friends especially at uni they would thrive in the evening and get all this work done and I am there's no I can't work at 3 a.m. Like I can't no. work at midnight. That's my brain doesn't work that way. I'm a morning person. So I get the hardest tasks done straight away. And I will usually focus on that until like lunchtime. And then honestly, after lunch, I become very chill. I start doing things that are more creative. So if I want to update my website or I'm working on like a new masterclass and I want to do the design elements, I do all of that in the evening whilst I've got something on in the background and it's far more chill. And then I normally stop working around like six. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. And I can already hear people will be going, that's what I want to do, but Jade, I'm going to work at that time. So yes. my answer is that, <laughs> well, you have to work the weekends. Like mm. that's what I would say is like, if you want that kind of life mm. where you want to be a content creator or build a brand is, you know, it wasn't a case of we just plonked into this, right? No, this... and I had a job for like a good first chunk of it. Like I was what I'd just been promoted as well. So I had a, like a newish job. It wasn't just like a, oh, we're gonna give you a new title. It was like a different job role. Um, and that it was really challenging. So I was doing that and I had other businesses. I still had like these boutiques that I used to run on the side. And then I had the YouTube channel that I was trying to build into a business really, really quickly. And I would wake up at five then, and then I would work from five until nine. This was back when everyone was working from home all the time. So that was definitely in my favor. So I'd work until five until nine, and then I'd get ready until half nine. I used to start my job at half nine. And then I would work, focus on my job until like six. Mm -hmm. And then I would do like two hours until like eight. And then I'd chill and then I'd work on the weekends. But it was always with this, because I know that sounds a lot. So people will be listening to that and thinking that sounds like unachievable. What I will say is I worked myself up to it. And honestly, yeah. working like that and focusing like that is a muscle. The more you do it, I've always worked before my full-time job because I've always had things on the side. So honestly, by that point, it didn't feel that different. And it very much felt like a hobby. So it just, it felt a lot more, it felt a lot more enjoyable than it probably sounds that it did. Yeah. <laughs> and also I had a goal. I was like, this isn't going to be forever. I will put in the graft right now. I bear in mind that I was like young, working from home. I didn't have kids. So there's all these other variables, but I was like, I can do this right now. My lifestyle means that I can dedicate this time right now. So I'm going to do it. And then once I was able to quit, I could quit. And then that's when this kind of schedule became a lot more doable. Love it. I, that's the thing. And I want to come in with hard facts, right? So for <laughs> anyone watching, it is really hard. Like the thing is there's so many perks, right? Mm. The brands, the sponsors, uh, working kind of like your hours and everything that we get to do right mm. is, is wicked and stuff like that but jumping to the very beginning of this you're absolutely right you all have to have a goal like you mm. have to know why you're doing this and i think that's where it's super important to understand your niche and how you're going to add value because i don't think until you figure out how you're going to serve people mm. you can really grow because mm. i think if you're kind of here there and everywhere you don't know why yeah you're never going to hit those goals and yeah. i and i think the sacrifices is a massive thing like i said to you on your podcast I barely slept and I was mm. fine with it. Like, you know, I was mm. very used to that anyway, but you know, I was willing to give up sleep in mm. order to run a 40 plus hour week, mm. young family, and just within the hours that I was given, like mm. I was prepared to do that because like you just said, it was never gonna be forever. Yeah. And I, and I think one thing that bugs me about this world, you turn around to someone now and say, by the way, you're not gonna have to go out for the next two years. You're gonna have to cut back for mm. the next two years, but mm. you can have everything you wanted in two years to come. And they're gonna go, Oh, fucking two years. Yeah, two it's years. the short term what, versus months? long term thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I feel yeah. like people hear two, two, pain. three years mm. and it pains them. And mm. I'm like, two, three years, like, yeah. and then you could have everything you wanted. Yeah. But you've got to live like a pauper. People are like, you know, I've, yeah. uh, uh, is that because we are also in a world of like quick consumption? I think there's a few things at play there. I think one side of it is that 
it looks really easy, mm. especially if you are looking to, because I think there's two different types of creators. There's, and they're, they're both equally access, um, successful, but there's creators who have businesses. So they create content to build a business and that's very much what we do. And then there's creators who create content to have influence and they primarily focus on having big audiences and they work with brands a lot. Both are like different routes. And a lot of the time people see this type, so the ones who have influence and they often make it look very easy because they put in so much graph to get to where they are. They then get to a point where they're like, I just have to share my day and yeah. I can work with brands. So with people see that and, like and they're that. like, well, that doesn't look hard. And then there's the other creators like us being like, no, no, we're running like a whole business here. Like this is really difficult. And then there's other creators who aren't quite at that level yet who are like, no, no, this is taking quite a bit of graft. So I think there's an idea that maybe it's easier than it is. Yeah. And then I think people are disappointed when you say to them, like a, a version of your conversation that you mentioned that I have often is when I talk to people about, about YouTube and I'm like, okay, well, let's just figure out what your commitment goal is for the next year. Cause I had one, I was like, okay, the next 12 months, I'm going to upload twice a week and I'm going to try and improve my videos each time. Like no excuses, doesn't matter how many people I have in my audience, doesn't matter if I'm getting two views, I cannot quit YouTube, I cannot change my strategy until I've done that, right? And then when I say that, and then people are like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because it, cause it, it looks easier. And then you have the anomalies again. You know, we love to ho yeah. hold on to the anomalies. You have the anomalies like, um, Emma Chamberlain, she's mm. a really good example, who uploaded a couple of videos and just blew up and saw so much success. And there's a few other creators, who I can't remember their names, but there's a few creators who I've witnessed like that. And we cling to them and we're like, but they didn't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's well, an anomaly. <laughs> like I'm saying to you with Jason, it, he's only blown up now and he's been on it for eight years. Mm. Because the thing is you, you do, you look at the ones that have been really successful and mm. you think, that, that that's the one that I like. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, so if I start, I could be like, yeah. right, okay, yeah. I'm going to ignore everything else. And I I think I did a post not too long ago about denial versus the truth. Mm. So when people say, oh, yeah, but that's a lot of commitment. Okay, let me see what you do during the week. Okay, you go out, you consume this mm. two, four hours a day, scrolling, you binge watch Netflix, you go out, you do drugs, you smoke, you do this, you don't <laughs> work out enough. Okay, who is actually really living an unhealthy mm. uh, lack of purpose life? And yeah. actually, you know, it's kind of, we are in a world where, People who don't understand the brand world, the business world of, of the day and age that we live in are very judgmental, I feel. Mm. I feel there is this, I had a conversation at the gym that there does seem to be a big divide between baby boomers who are very set mm. in their ways, who really capitalized on property growth mm. and they were in that economic Mm. you know flyby where things just mm. took off mm. and it's kind of like well the younger generation they don't work that hard now mm. no actually i would say that there is more up against young people now mm. so you have to be more creative and unfortunately being creative is with a laptop and phone yeah and you have to be quirky yeah. you have to be something different yeah so w w there's the whole baby boom generation is yeah. so different to where we are now yeah. like so yeah. different. and i also think there's this whole concept of like exponential growth that has we have very much benefited from like we and the younger generations below us like we are the ones who grew up with the ability to create content for free online mm. and grow an audience within weeks months years and turn you can start a business and you know like like i said i quit my job within six or seven months like that is a huge life-changing thing to happen yeah. that i did for free using my phone I think if you grew up in an age where it was more about sticking to something for a really long time and seeing very small rewards, like incremental kind of raises and stuff as a result of mm. that. And then you look at younger people who are like, oh, what, and you think you could just post some videos and then you're gonna create a million pound business? Yeah. Like it must be such a hard thing for like different generations to grapple with. I, I think it is, because <laughs> obviously the, the rapid, the speed wasn't there for yeah. the younger, uh, for the older generation. But at the same time, I saw this meme and it was hilarious and it was like a bunch of old people dancing in a hall like mm. doing this quirky dance and it was and the meme was uh when i bought my house my houses for six raspberries <laughs> and sold it for two, yeah. <laughs> two million dollars yeah you're so right but you know, again so that's a longer thing isn't it it is a longer thing <laughs> but also like you know voting has always been mm predominantly in favor of the older generation because yeah. younger ones don't. So mm. they've, they've always voted to make sure that the mm. older generation have benefited certainly with taxes and stuff, but that's yeah. a whole nother podcast. Yeah. But <laughs> in terms of, let's talk about the two big players right now. We've got the mothership YouTube, mm. which are dominating. Mm -hmm. TikTok is very much my game at the moment, mm -hmm. but trying to move over to the YouTube. Someone looking at this right now thinking, okay, cool. Definitely want to do this. This is my thing. I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Mm. How would you say, 
really that the key things to be looking at when starting a YouTube channel. Yeah. So I think as with everything, you always want to start with your audience first. I think there's less focus on niching down straight away on YouTube. If you have a good idea of who your audience are, so you go with your audience rather than your niche and you create content for them. So even if that ends up being in a couple different buckets. So for me, for example, when I started, I still had my boutiques. So I was talking about entrepreneurship. I was talking about social media, but I also had this, this part of that that was talking about like, Ecom and stuff that I don't talk about now, but that was part of my strategy to start off with. So I was talking about a few different things. And over time with YouTube, your analytics will tell you which one to focus on. And that's like such a beautiful thing about YouTube. The analytics are incredibly robust. So it will literally say like, no, this is the thing that people will find the most valuable. So as long as you still start with that YouTube though, those that audience though, mine were entrepreneurs. It wasn't like I was like everyone and then talking yeah. about anything. Um, then you can play around and you can get to know your audience that way, which is amazing. I think starting with your audience first, try and immerse yourself in the platform because YouTube is another beast. Mm. And in the best way possible, it gives you so many tools, so many analytics, it's so robust. It requires so much effort and energy from you though, that it's not the kind of platform that you necessarily just wanna be like, let me just go on a whim. You probably wanna spend some time learning about it and actually understanding how it works because it's driven by SEO and SEO in itself. I mean, you have whole teams who focus specifically on search engine optimization. Yeah. If you're not familiar with what that is or anything, that's probably an area you wanna focus on just to understand it from YouTube's perspective so you can get to grips with how the platform truly works. Yeah, That's very much what I did. I immersed myself in it for a while and that massively contributed to my ability to grow it as quickly as I did. I think that's probably what I haven't done enough is really looking at those analytics and mm. what it wants because yeah. I think like, I said to you, I think I was a bit too broad when I started my mm. YouTube channel. And I think now to niche, I suppose the only thing when you niche is like for someone who likes to talk about a lot, it's kind of like sucking up like, oh, I really wanna mm. talk about other things, but yeah. I know that this platform yeah. wants me to talk about one thing. I've heard it many times, but I think when you get to a certain level, then you can start talking about other things yeah. and kind of people will listen anyway at that point, do you think? Yeah, that is true. And it also depends on the format of the content that you're creating. So if you are like a vlogger, for example, then again, as long as you've gotten really clear on who your audience are, you can talk about different things because the format of your content is the behind the scenes of your life and your audience are so like, I don't want to say your audience are niche, but for example, there is a travel blogger. She's called Lydia Dinger. Love her work. You guys should go look at it. Um, really, really talented vlogger, right? Um, I say travel vlogger because those are the videos that I watch from her, but she vlogs her everyday life. She's very clear on who her community are. And mm -hmm. therefore she's very clear on like what elements of her life her community like to see and engage with. So she's still able to talk about different things like fitness and travel and fashion, but she does it through the lens of her community. So it's not like she's talking about fashion and she's talking about a style that her community aren't into. She's talking about fashion, specifically a style that her audience are into. Yeah. So people who are more kind of vlogger style creators have that ability, but it's a lot harder for them to grow. Like it's yeah. a lot harder to grow a vlogging account. On the flip side, if you're really niche down and you create content more like ours, then that's usually when you're gonna find growth to come a lot easier to you. You don't have to do it, like with anything on social media, there's nothing you have to do. But if you're trying to grow quicker, being clear on who your audience are and having a niche is gonna be the thing that helps you because YouTube will understand what your content is about far quicker and it will recommend it to the right people very, very quickly. But in addition to that, when someone finds one video, so you get one video that blows up, mine was about Instagram's algorithm. That was my first like proper blow up video. I had like 20 videos that I'd already uploaded that were designed for the same type of person who would be mm. interested in the Instagram algorithm video. So instead of just getting one viral video and then maybe growing a little bit, I ended up getting one viral video and I went from like 500 to 10,000 subscribers in weeks because you found that video and then mm. you watched the others yeah. and now you're gonna subscribe. Yeah. Whereas if I had all this other random content about my plants and a dog, you would have been like, okay, it's just that video I like. I don't need to subscribe to the channel. I just yeah. want that video. I think the thing that I find sexy about YouTube is that even I had a lot of friends last year that became multi-millionaires, mm. not only millionaires, but multi-millionaires mm. gross. And that's the thing is like, it's so powerful. Like it is the mothership. Not, yeah. I'm a bit cautious about talking about this too much because I'm thinking, is this going to go into a short clip? Don't want to put it on a certain <laughs> platform. But it truly is. I think that's where everyone wants to eventually mm. dominate because I think when we look at platforms, you also want to look... How crazy is it? Like, has it mm. stood the test of time? Yes. Is it driving SEO? Like it's massive, mm. especially if you want to, if you're identifying 
when building a brand and a business, are you going for the affiliate link like mm. route where mm. you can vlog and mm. go in shops and food mm. reviews? Or are you thinking, I'm gonna be doing videos with a subconscious call to action and mm. I'm gonna start getting conversions. So mm. I think that's the thought process is do you go affiliate link, building a business, but I do believe eventually on YouTube is like yeah. where you want to be. And that's yeah. why I said this year for me. Yeah, YouTube is, yeah. So to your point about like looking at the platforms, do they stand the test of time? It's such a good point because YouTube have been around for so long and yeah. they've been the front runners for so long. I know there's other platforms that might lead in different metrics, but they have been consistent for a while. And a big reason for that is because they were the first platform to realize that they need to pay creators if they're gonna to continue to stay on the platform. Yeah. So when other platforms had creators leave because they were like, oh, I'm not getting the same response anymore, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the time they were going to YouTube because they were like, well, I'll, I'm just gonna get paid for doing the same thing over there. Yeah. And that seems like an obvious thing now, but. 10 years ago, the idea of a social media platform paying the creators was unheard of because every other platform thought, no, creators should feel privileged to be able to create for mm. us. It was a completely different way of approaching things. So they've managed to ret retain a lot of their biggest creators, which means they've managed to retain a lot of their viewers and their audiences, right? So that's like a big reason why I love YouTube so much as well. But beyond all of that, when you specifically long form content on YouTube, shorts are great as well but specifically with your longer form content on YouTube, the ability you have to connect with your audience and build trust is unmatched on any other format of content, yeah. not counting podcasts because it's similar. But if we're looking at like social media sites, it is unmatched because you are literally retaining someone's attention for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Can you imagine doing that on TikTok or Instagram? Like. Yeah. It is unheard of, it's so difficult to do. And that's why brands pay more to be like integrated in a YouTube video. They do that because they know it's more valuable. Yeah. They know that you can talk about a brand or a product for three minutes and keep someone's attention. You yeah. could, that's so difficult to do almost anywhere else, you know? Well, you also think big old corporations, how much they would pay in ads. Oh my God, yeah. And uh, certain videos and promotional uh, videos mm. to get the retention. I mean, I do on average on YouTube, you know, it's, it's all right. It's, I do between like 800 to a thousand hours a month. Yeah, so it's kind good. of like, it's pretty good. Yeah. You think what companies would pay for that? Oh my God. Just that retention. Yeah. Like, that's the thing, time under retention or yeah. whatever you want to call it. But when someone is watching you, you are building credibility, mm. reputation, mm. and eventually, again, warming them up mm. to be, be potential leads. Yeah. And then it's kind of, where do you funnel them? On the flip side, the thing that I see happening now is obviously TikTok mm. is wanting to compete with the mothership YouTube. Yes. And we're going into long form videos. Mm. And what I am finding now is I kind of start a little bit early. Like my, mm. I can talk and kind of keep people hooked in with like three different hooks. Mm. But like I'm keeping people retained now for over five minute videos. Mm. And what a change, because now obviously the Creativity Beta Fund. Yeah, it's, it's literally centered on one minute or it's, longer. It's very clever well, moves it's, from it's, them. It's <laughs> insane, really, especially like RPM at the moment mm. is like a pound 18 for me mm. per thousand views. Mm. So like now when, when we're doing, it's quite achievable to get a million, two, three million views. And yeah. you're thinking that's, that's two grand, yeah. that's two grand a video. Yeah. You know, and at the moment I do on average about 13 million a month. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. So but it hasn't stood the test of time just yet. Yeah, no, and it might. Yeah. And I think it's so great to be early adopters with stuff, like give it a go. If you don't know, like, is this gonna be around for a while, but you you have passion towards it, you naturally find creating that type of content quite enjoyable, then give it a go. You're not gonna lose anything, but no, it hasn't yet. And I also, I'm not completely sure about the mechanics behind their program. Is it a revenue split? It's a revenue split. Uh, They take very, they take very small fees on the on the fund. Yeah. I know they take bigger fees on the shop. Yeah. But I think what, I what TikTok have at the moment with mm. the ability is, one, they don't know what they're doing with taking random videos down and mm. putting people on warnings. But I think they're integrating. So this year alone, TikTok has said that it's gonna be 10Xing its commercial yes, spend into that. the platform, right? Mm. So that means, uh, it means all kinds of different things. More revenue streams, easier usage for the consumer and creator. Mm. So what they have done very well, which YouTube hasn't got offered uh, anywhere yet, is mm. they've integrated the shop, the affiliates, mm. the series. So you can run all your own digital programs mm. in the platform and plug them everywhere. Yeah. So they have got some unique features, but with everything that's going on in China and America, yeah. you don't want to overcommit. 
yeah. almost, you know? Yeah, you never wanna, you, it's, it's that whole thing about having all your eggs in one basket, isn't it? Because every platform wants you to do that. Like Instagram, when they release subscriptions, they were, I mean, they have like a thousand new features every few minutes, but they are constantly trying to get you to put all of your income driving activity with them. Yeah. And then YouTube do have like a shop integration or like a merch integration, but it's nowhere near as big. Like no other platform has managed to integrate shopping the way that TikTok has. Because Instagram tried last year and then they had to turn down their like live shopping, shopping feature. They are like the market leaders when it comes to that. And I think that's gonna massively help them. But I do think every platform kind of has their thing, you yeah. know? Because I feel like with Instagram, for example, I think they're focusing on direct messaging and private sharing. Because I mean, yeah. they come out and say it quite often. They're like, we realize that more and more people share content privately than they do public on, publicly on our platform. And I think they can see like, okay, well their direct mes messaging feature is more robust than anyone else's. People are sharing more con content like in groups privately. So that's their USP. Yeah. TikTok are like, well, TikTok shop is absolutely blowing up. So that's our USP. And then YouTube are like, well, long form content is still king here. And then now they're integrating their podcast offering. So they're like yeah. long form, like that's our USP, which yeah. I personally find very refreshing because we're coming from a time where everyone just copied each other. Yeah. And I still think they'll still carry on doing that. But before it was like, no one had a USP. It was just like, oh, well they're doing this and I want to do it. And I just yeah. think it's so much cleaner well, that, <laughs> when everyone's just clear on what they're doing. I think the, the beauty of it is we have access to all of it for free, right? Mm. So building a brand is like fair game for everyone. Mm. And the diversification, I think super important. Mm. One thing you even said to me, I actually have more now than when <laughs> uh, I came on your podcast, but you were like, how do you manage all of those platforms? Yeah. You, you know, I've so got more Instagram uh, profiles now mm. I think again it's time management like mm. this game is about what you're willing to put in up front like how bad do you want it and yeah. in what time frame but then also consistency in time management like yeah. you were talking about your routine mm. mine's very very similar like mm. it's super super structured every day and when these platforms can be quite overwhelming mm. structure goes a long way mm. in terms of really immersing yourself on the platforms something that everyone will come up against um, actually, I can put my hand up and say that I haven't had this. Okay. But I've never socially compared or competed with everyone else. I'm mm. I'm very like high, I'm very hyper focused. Yeah, yeah. How, how have you found that, or how do you navigate sort of like not getting caught up looking at what other people yeah. are doing and then questioning yourself? This is such like a relevant topic because I previously never really had a huge problem with it. So I well, I don't really think I ever had a problem with it at all. To be honest, it was never really something what came into my kind of ether but then I do remember working with a lot of creators who were struggling a lot with that especially like a typical thing that we do when we're starting out is that you compare your like step one to someone else's step 20 yeah. and I would get a lot of people still now they'll be like but you do this and I'm like I do this full time I've been doing it for years and I have like a team <laughs> like wasn't I wasn't doing this in, in day one like I you know I worked up to it but I will say that recently, like literally last week, I felt myself starting to compare. And I remember I caught it very quick. And it's it's funny because when we were talking about like um, social media usage and like if we find ourselves on social media a lot earlier, I found myself last week that I was on social media more, like from just a general user perspective, just scrolling more than I normally am. Mm. So when I noticed that, I decided to go on like a break. So Friday through to Monday, I was away for the weekend anyway. It was my husband's birthday. So we went in a little cabin in the woods and I was like, cool, I'm just not gonna go on social media for the weekend. And I came back on Monday and I was like, I feel like a different person. Yeah. Like it was literally like, I feel like a different person. I feel back to myself. Sometimes we are so absorbed on the, on what, what do people call it? Critically online. Yeah. Sometimes we are so critically online that it becomes all consuming and you forget to just like have your grip on reality. Absolutely. <laughs> and to center yourself and be like, no, no, this is my life. My life isn't the content that I'm consuming online. Yeah. And I find that a lot of the time when I have these conversations, people who struggle with comparison, it's a similar thing. I'm like, you are consuming yourself with so much content and so much content that's similar to yours that is triggering, triggering you to feel like you need to do more. Yeah, You know, it's a massive thing. Mm. There's uh, things that I'm talking a lot about at the moment, which is uh, you either designed uh, you either design your life or you're assigned mm. a life. Like, mm. So everyone's got two options. I find it's exactly the same with content. Mm. You become the creator or mm. you consume negatively, mm. which ties into, um, I I've, I've did a blog on this the other day and I wrote a newsletter, which is called something uh, which is spoken about casual anxiety. Mm. So like there is this more kind of people saying, oh, you know, I've got anxiety and you mm. almost want to go, why? Mm. Well, you know, it's just that we're in a very busy, yeah, I know, but 
taking out like PTSD, trauma and abuse as a child and stuff like that. Like why figure out why have you got casual, mm, casual like anxiety? What the trigger is. What is it? And it's so funny really, because I, I find the fix could be quite simple. Mm. And there's this routine in the morning that the typical person does. And they go on their phone. Wake up in the yeah. morning, alarm goes off, literally laying with their partner or no one or whatever, mm. right? You reach for your phone. Mm. Your phone's like this close mm. to your face and you scroll mm. and your your brain hasn't even woken up. Like it's no. not able to identify, well, how did they get there? Well, question this. Well, yeah. that's not reality. And you're, you're absorbing this perfect lifestyle. Mm. And then the second phase of that, once you've compared your entire life to mm. this perfect world, <laughs> you go down and most people have caffeine yeah so now you stimulate your body which turns into paranoia and anxiety mm. and then the third part of that process is most people will go into a job that they're not overly yeah. keen on open up their emails new so level they, of anxiety there isn't yeah there? <laughs> so they've so they've like you, you've set yourself up for failure and yeah. unfortunately what's the what's the fourth part well most people may not work out and then they come home yeah and then they consume they just, the news yeah and do you know what i've always been like such a believer in taking in having a morning that's for yourself to the yeah. point where i have vivid memories of being in school like I'm talking I don't even know if it was primary school or not I was young and I used to wake up early so that I could this makes me sound like so ridiculous I used to wake up early so that I could read for like an hour and then I wanted to watch my show I feel like I was watching like Powerpuff Girls or something and I wanted to go watch my show for like an hour and my mum would always be like you don't need to wake up earlier like I'd be up like before her and she was like you don't need to wake up early and then I used to say to her I feel like if I don't have this time for myself I feel like all I'm doing is going to school what an old song I must have been. I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm just living for work. I love I it. Felt, That's I felt what I was like, like, yeah, I felt like all I was doing was going to school. We're only at school for six hours, but I was like, oh, what? I just wake up and I'm, I'm straight away. I'm I want my at time. school. Yeah, <laughs> I want my time. I want, I want time to myself. That's what my son's like. I want to ease myself into the day. That, that's a healthy thing. You know, that's a good yeah. sign of a healthy yeah. thing of, of being aware, like mm. of, of how precious time is. I mean, while you were watching the Rugrats, I would have been watching the Hoobs <laughs> or, or or the Rugrats or yeah. the Hey Arnold. That's, that's what you always do and have my head in like a Harry Potter book and be like this. Yeah. And I used to like eat my breakfast whilst reading and then get porridge everywhere. I have such vivid memories of it. But, but that's <laughs> a super important thing, time out. Like mm. I did a video again the other day and I said, no one will notice you if you go, if you go absent for a week. Yeah, I That's the funny time. thing. You Look, I think it's important if you're running a business, like it is, mm. you know, it's important. You can't just leave a, a workplace. Mm. So I think you would schedule things, right? Yeah. If I go away, I schedule mm. posts and you know, it's great. You can do it with newsletters, blogs. Mm. But it's super important that, like you say, it's funny. I actually meet up with certain friends of mine and not that they've ever said it to me, but my mm. phone will go away. Like when mm. I'm, there's a particular friend of mine, Steve, I'm seeing him this week actually, is that when I meet with Steve, we meet every maybe six or seven weeks. Mm. We just have a laugh. Yeah. And that's it. The phone doesn't come out or anything like that. And I'm just me and we have such a good laugh. And it's like, it's almost uh rejuvenating mm. it's, it's really nice because mm. then you go back with a bit of a clear head right cool what's yeah. the content what yeah, am i yeah, doing yeah. this week yeah whereas taking breaks is important do, do you know live streaming right mm. i don't think this is i don't know if you attack i don't it live on, stream no one day i probably thoughts? will so i see the ba the power and the value in live streaming so much i think the fact that it allows you to literally speak with your audience in real time and there is yeah. no other feature that allows you to do that like the ability that that gives you to build trust and that community and the engagement is like unparalleled yeah. so i really see the value in it I don't live stream because I it would force me to show up at a specific time. The way I create content is very in advance and I do it purposely like that because it gives me a bit more freedom around my day. Like if I'm like, okay, well actually something's popped up, I'm gonna go babysit my nephew or actually I'm not gonna film today because I'm more in a, like a design space or I'm more in a copywriting space. It gives me the freedom to do that because I batch yeah. so much of my content. So that's the main reason why I've avoided lives because they are, once I've scheduled them, I have to do them at that time. <laughs> yeah, I had to defend myself. So I live stream a lot, but yeah. just for that reason, I was setting certain times. I was announcing mm. it like on my TikToks. This is really crazy, right? So note to everyone, but on my TikTok stories, if I post on there, whether it's a poll or a photo mm. or an announcement, mm -hmm. I'll get like 50, 60K views. Oh, nice. Instagram. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's Instagram nuts. stories. Like, Instagram stories it's like is five to 10 percent of your it's audience. It's like, like dead. Yeah. But I was <laughs> feeling this pressure of. I love, you know, love live streaming. Again, uh, can really add like live value and mm. you can do like live conversions. Mm. But I was feeling this obligation. Certainly in the end days, I was like, oh, fucking, yeah. oh, I've just gone out. Or oh, I couldn't do anything. Like I was thinking, oh, I've just, oh, fuck, I've got 
live stream. Yeah, yeah. Oh, bollocks, got to go home. It messes with your flexibility a bit. It, it does. So mm. what I've said now, I think if anyone's going to go down that route of live streaming on a certain platform, I think, yeah, it's great. But just ask people to set notifications on. Yeah. And if they can join, they can join. Yeah, yeah, like, that's yeah. That's the way I live my life now. Yeah. I'll go live randomly. Yeah. And kind of people expect that. So, mm. but yeah, they, again, there's that balance of like not too much. Yeah. So what does the, what is like 2024, the future hold? Like what's your plan? How do you, uh, how are you going to execute like growing mm. even more? Like what's the bigger picture yeah. here? Yeah. Well, I plan in like quarters now. So I always look at like, okay, well, what's my goal for the next quarter and next quarter? So I mentioned before that up until this point, I very much created products and services based on what my audience were asking for me. And that served me really well. And it also allowed me to like grow my personal brand to a point where last year I was able to take a step back and think, okay, I can actually rejig some things now. Like I could create something the way that I really want my future business to look. And I can do that because my personal brand will keep me afloat for a little while. So what I'm basically doing now and what my focus is, which I'm really excited for, is I do have a separate brand from myself. It's called The Creator Project. You was on our podcast. And I'm building out like a membership for The Creator Project that is going to sit over there. So nice. my long-term goal was like, okay, I've got my personal brand. And this is the privilege of having a building a personal brand. You're, you're able to do this. I now want something that isn't reliant on me. Yeah. So Great. that's what the creator project is. It will, I'm going to build it to a point where I'm like, this can live without me. Yeah. And it will have like, it has guest experts in it that aren't just me. You like it's not it. all, yeah, I could sell it. Yeah. Everything I'd built up to this point was like, jade yeah. and like you were only if you found out about it it was only through my content i my dream is to build the creator project to a point where i'm like people join who have no idea who i am yeah that's like the thought of that is just absolutely amazing to me <laughs> that's the beauty I, I would say that's a really important point actually is that when you go into this brand is it something you want to be doing for the rest of your life i imagine no because we mm. would want to disappear into our own little worlds at some point mm. super important that's why we built peak performance is yeah that eventually we can scale that it's not reliant on me and paul yeah. as the founders and we can sell it mm. and an event business you know scale it right you know mm. talking yeah, mi yeah millions really and like well. we were just thinking that there is not reliant on us mm. like you know so i think that's also important is if you're even building a business mm. you've called yours the creator project it's mm. not tied to jade like exactly. super important yeah so Jade, as we come to a close, where can mm. people find out more about your, your, your freebies that you do yeah. and checking out your channel and where's kind of, where do you want people to go? For sure. Well, I'll send you a link because I think the best place would to start with my free creator income guide because yeah. I think anyone listening would get a lot of value from that. Um, but my main channel is YouTube. So if you want to find me on YouTube, I'm Jade Beeson. I'd love to hang out with you there. Amazing. <laughs> All the links will be in the description. Jade, absolute pleasure. Loved having you on. Yeah. We could go on for ages. I know like, you really could. These, could. these could go on. We've done an hour already, but uh, everyone, we will see you all soon jade thanks so much thanks for having me Cheers.